Let us pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, bought and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and by faith raised with him in the first resurrection, so that you will also take part in the second. There is only one goal that matters to every man, woman, and child on this earth. And anyone who would not willingly sacrifice all things for that one thing is a complete and utter fool. It shouldn't be that hard to understand this. Everybody has goals, right? You have long-term goals, short-term goals, and you sacrifice for your goals. You take a part of your paycheck, probably, and sacrifice and put it into your savings account or into a college fund for your children or something else. You sacrifice a part of your day, perhaps, to maybe exercise or work on your piano skills or your trumpet or your flute or your sports skills, whatever it is. You do that to get better at those things. If you're a runner, maybe to, to take a few seconds off of that race time. And sometimes these different goals that we have, they collide with each other, right? And you have to pick one over another. You have to prioritize one over another. And depending on your personality or your circumstance, it's going to change how you do that. But one thing is very clear, and that is that there is one goal that trumps everything else by a mile. And Paul tells us that that goal is the resurrection to eternal life. Verses 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. When Paul uses the word attain here, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Because when we use that, hear that word attain, maybe we think it has something to do with like we earn it, right? I, I attain this by something I do. But the word itself simply means to arrive. For instance, it's constantly used in the book of Acts to talk about, oh, these people got on a boat and then they journeyed and then they arrived. It means to arrive at a goal, at a desired destination. That's what Paul's talking about. His goal is the resurrection from the dead. And he'll stop at nothing to make that happen any way possible. And you know what? That's the one thing about Paul that didn't change from when he was a Pharisee to now. See, before he used to persecute Christians, before he was dead set against them, he was doing that. He was wrong, but he was doing that because he wanted to attain the resurrection of the dead. In Acts chapter 26, Paul says this, Now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, same word, to arrive, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? See, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees did. And Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. This had always been Paul's hope. That hasn't changed. What has changed is the means by which Paul hopes to arrive there. And people sometimes say the end justifies the means. Sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's very debatable. Like, for instance, if I said, oh, that messy kitchen is justified by the delicious meal. That's true. Or people might say, Robin Hood stealing from the rich is justified by him giving to the poor. Oh, might be true, might not be true. Or some people would argue that dropping two nuclear bombs on Japan is justified by the end of the war. And again, that's a topic of major debate in all kinds of circles. At its heart, this concept of the end justifying the means is about pragmatism. Pragmatism is the philosophy of whatever works. Right? Whatever works for you. I don't care how you get it done, as long as you get it done. It's fine. Paul is entirely pragmatic. He has this one goal, the resurrection from the dead, and he wants to get there, and he doesn't care how he does it. The only right way to get to the resurrection of the dead is the way that works. Paul says, if by any means necessary, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. And in this case, what Paul teaches us in this text is that the only way is Jesus. It isn't quite the end justifies the mean, but rather that justification is the means the only means to this end, to this goal. 
Martin Luther, which you're remembering a lot this year, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Martin Luther was a lot like Paul in a whole lot of ways. <laughs> both of them had been going the wrong way, trying to be saved by their works, because both of them wanted the same thing. You read about those early years of Luther in the monastery, and it's obvious that he is dead set on the resurrection. He wants to go to heaven. He's terrified at the concept of going to hell. And he was told, as, as they were all told then, that he needed to confess all his sins. And if he forgot even one, and it was, then it was on his soul when he died, he was going to go to purgatory or to hell. A terrified Luther. He took it seriously. Apparently, no one else took it very seriously, but he did. And he would at times spend six hours confessing his sins to his confessor, which drove the guy crazy. Luther would sit there thinking of all these different things, all these thoughts he had had, all these attitudes he had had, and then he would leave and he would say how he maybe would feel good about how he'd confessed all his sins and then he'd realize that that was a sin. It just goes on and on and on. Luther came to realize that that didn't work. This method of work righteousness, this method of cleansing myself, he would later write in the Heidelberg Disputation, the law of God the most salutary doctrine of life cannot advance man on his way to righteousness, but rather hinders him. In other words, the law makes it harder for you to be righteous before God on your own. And Luther had tried. This is exactly what Paul's talking about in verses 4 to 7. Here you have something of a checklist of confidence in the flesh. By confidence in the flesh, Paul means thinking that I can be righteous before God because of who I am and what I've done, that I could attain to the resurrection by who I am and what I've done. And look at all the things he says. He's saying that he was the best of the best when it came to trying to be saved by the law. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's probably particularly apropos because uh, there was a group of false teachers called Judaizers, we call them the Judaizers, who were there in Philippi as they had been in Galatia, and they were telling the people, Trusting in Jesus isn't enough. You also got to keep the Mosaic ceremony a law. And Paul says, been there, done that. I was circumcised just like you're supposed to be. I kept all the other things. He goes on, of the tribe of Benjamin, of the people of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's saying, I'm the best Hebrew. I'm the most hebrew -y Hebrew that ever lived. That's me. You know, some people would say too, some Jews would say, we're saved just because we're descended from Abraham. Paul says, I got that covered. He goes on, as to the law of Pharisee. Uh, the Pharisees had, by far, the strictest regulations for keeping the law. You know, there were all kinds of different laws in the Old Testament. You had moral laws, like the Ten Commandments applied to everybody. You had ceremonial laws that had to do with worship in the temple. And some of those only applied to the priests. But the Pharisees actually would say, well, we're going to keep those ones too, because we're extra holy. And then they made up their own laws to add on top of that. See, we're really holy. It's a reminder that our human flesh always looks for that sort of thing, always looks to even add to God's law to show that we're better than other people, that we're holier, that, that we're going to do this ourselves. And very often it, it takes good things and turns them into bad by insisting on them in that way. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I've never noticed that this has happened, but it's just a thought that I had. We have our Wednesday night Vesper services, which are quite nice, and uh, we've been doing those. We started that in order for uh, people who sometimes can't make it on Sunday because of work, give them another option, other people to enjoy another opportunity to hear God's word. But let's just say, what, what if, what if people started coming, some people started coming every, every week, and then they started feeling like, well, look, we come here every week. Those guys don't. We must love God more than them. We must be better than them. And that'd be entirely wrong. It'd be the exact same thing the Pharisees were doing. Paul's saying, though, when I was a Pharisee, I had all that, and I kept it perfectly. Notice what he says, as to the law, blameless. He's not saying that he never sinned. He's saying that according to the way the Pharisees defined a sin, he never sinned. He never outwardly broke any of the laws. And then he adds this, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And you might think, is Paul bragging about killing Christians? Isn't that bad? But notice what he's saying. When he was a Pharisee, he thought that that was God's will. He was wrong. He thought it was God's will, though. And he did it hardcore. He was extremely zealous about it. That's his point. But looking back on all this now, what does Paul say? I have more reason to boast in the flesh than anybody, but he says, it's all loss. It's all worthless. It's worse than worthless. 
It doesn't help me on my way to righteousness. It doesn't help me to arrive at the resurrection. It hinders me. It made it impossible for me to attain the resurrection. And he says, all this I count loss compared to the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know, many people speak of zeal. I mentioned zeal a second ago. As if it's an end in itself. As if it by itself is good enough to get us to the resurrection. For instance, last year we were, we were distributing those pamphlets for our church over in the neighborhoods around here. And somehow, one of them got in the hands of a nun. It's kind of funny. We weren't like targeting that sort of thing, but a nun got it. And she wrote me a letter. And, and she basically said two things in the letter. First, that she disagreed with our doctrine. And second, that she applauded me for my zeal. I thought, what? But that's actually a teaching of the Roman church. They'll say, for instance, that if a Muslim is super zealous about their beliefs, they're really sincere, they'll go to heaven. As long as they don't know that they're supposed to be in the Catholic church and they're super zealous for their beliefs, they'll go to heaven. Because they think zeal is an end in itself. That, that religious fervor and devotion is good enough. Trying really hard is good enough. But think of it like this. If you were had a, had a really fast runner, or you were a really fast runner, and, and you're standing there at the starting line, and, and the gun goes off, and you run the opposite direction. Being faster than all the other runners doesn't help you. It makes it worse. If you were slower, you wouldn't be as bad off as you are because you're so fast and you ran the wrong direction. That's what this is like. Being really zealous for the wrong thing brings us further away from God. Being really good in our own minds at trying to keep the law at work righteousness brings us further away from God. Because this means can not justify. It cannot in any part, in even the smallest way, bring us to God and bring us to the goal we desire. But faith in Christ can and unfailingly does. Luther, again, writes in the Heidelberg Disputation, he is not righteous who does much. But he who without works believes much in Christ. And that's exactly what Paul says in this text. Look at the massive array of ways in which Paul destroys any concept of trying to justify ourselves by our works. First he says, that I may know him. Compared to the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What did Jesus say? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It doesn't say that they may earn it on their own, but that they may know you. And then Paul goes on, being found in him. That's a passive word, found. That, does, that doesn't describe my activity. It's the idea of if you were like caught out in a terrible storm and you wouldn't hit in the cleft of a rock. Found in Jesus. And then he goes on to further define that term by saying, having not a righteousness of my own which comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And here's the scene he's picturing. One day, you will all stand before God, the judge. And all of your sins will be revealed. Those things that you have done that, that you feel most guilty for, out in the open. The words and thoughts that you would try to hide from everybody else, they'll be revealed. And the devil will come and he'll accuse you and say, look what you did. You're the worst. You're a damned sinner. You're going to hell. That's what the devil will say. And then God will say this. What do you have to say for yourself? And we who believe in Jesus Christ can say simply this. Exhibits Alpha through Omega. Jesus Christ I'm with him. I'm in him. I am hidden in him. His righteousness is mine. His forgiveness is mine. His life is mine. And that changes everything. That faith changes the whole case. Then no longer are you on trial before God. Now Jesus is. And then the verdict is obvious. Righteous. Holy. You have the crown of eternal life. Not damned, but forgiven forever because of him. That is what Paul is saying. This is the means to the end. For he is not righteous who works much, but he who without works believes much in Christ. Justification is the means to the end. And so Paul goes on, I press on to lay hold of this, 
because Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Notice what he says. Christ is the one who has started this. He has laid hold of me. He has brought me to faith. And lest anybody should think, okay, so Paul's saying that uh, God brought him to faith, and then now he talks about pressing on and straining, right? So he means that now it's up to us to finish it off. Understand what Paul means. If Paul is saying that his one goal is the resurrection, and that the only way he can achieve that is by faith in Christ and not his own works, then what he means when he says that he is pressing on, striving to lay hold of it, is that he is, by God's grace, continuing to believe in Jesus. That he is throughout his life fighting against any concept of saving himself. He's saying the exact opposite of thinking that, well, Jesus started it, now i got to finish it. He's saying Jesus does everything. He has reached out and laid hold of me. And this is the only righteousness that works. This is what he is striving for. Works don't work. Works don't justify. The only means which can bring you to the goal of the resurrection to eternal life is not a means which in itself, sorry, I've got to rephrase that, is not the means which justify the ends, but justification which is the means to the end of resurrection and life eternal. Because to be justified in Christ Jesus means for Jesus to be everything. It means that he has died in your place, that he was perfect in your place, that he has satisfied God's wrath against you, the vile offender, so that in Christ God declares you not guilty, forgives you, so that by grace you are righteous, not who work much, but who believe much in him for everything and in everything. And that's why Paul also mentions sufferings in this text. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Remember, Paul's not there yet. He says, I, I don't say that I've already attained. And what he means when he says, I don't say that I've already attained or I've already become perfect is rather obvious. I'm not in heaven yet. I haven't yet reached the resurrection. I'm still here, and I still face sufferings. Now I am still in this fellowship of Christ's sufferings. You know, sometimes when a person arrives at a goal, they might ask themselves, was it all worth it? An Olympian standing on the podium with that pure gold around his neck, and the reporter says, was the, was the prize worth the pain? And who wouldn't say yes? How much more isn't the crown of life eternal worth the pain. Both the means, which is faith in Christ, and the goal, which is resurrection, justify this pain and suffering that we face. Paul says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul Undoubtedly, he's thinking about his prison, you know, his imprisonment here. He's lost everything. He doesn't have wealth. He doesn't have earthly goods. He doesn't have earthly comforts. He doesn't even have his earthly freedom. Many of his friends are not with him either. At one point in this letter, he says, everyone has abandoned me, except Christ. And Paul says, fine. Let them all be gone. Let these sufferings come. For as long as I have Christ, they're all worth nothing but to be thrown away. That's what the word rubbish means. Something that has no worth other than to be thrown away, which means it has no worth at all. Luther echoed these sentiments in his hymn. Take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife. Let these all be gone. They yet have nothing won. The kingdom ours remaineth. Now understand something. Neither Paul nor Luther are suggesting that there is no value in these things. What they're saying is that compared to Christ, there's no value in these things. Compared to that, if you've got to choose between the two of them, there's, there's no choice at all. Imagine if you were out in the desert, and for, you know, for some reason you're out in the desert, and you don't have any water, and you know your time is short, you need to find a place that has water, and you happen to you know, fall into or come across a cave filled with gold and treasures, like in Aladdin. What are you going to do? Well, unless you're an idiot, you're not going to take any of them with you. What good would it do? They're going to weigh you down. It's going to be heavy. Gold is heavy. It's going to weigh you down. It's not going to help you find water. What good does a gold cup do if there's no water in it? And you're not really concerned about being rich right now. You're just concerned about being alive. Water in that situation is far more precious than gold. 
so also here. Paul's saying, leaving behind, letting go of the things behind and pressing on to the things ahead. If there's anything in this life which is going to hold me back from trusting in Christ alone, fine, let it be gone. And Paul recognizes that when God brings sufferings on us, all he is doing is cutting off the excess weight. All he is doing is cutting off something which will keep us from trusting in him. That's what Paul means when he says, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, literally being conformed to his death. Picture it like this. You're all, by nature, this glob of wood. It's log. And God is the carver, and he starts to whittle you down. And that doesn't always feel good. But through this process, through suffering and his word, which he, which he gives us together, he shapes us into the cross. He brings us through sufferings to be joined with Christ. See, remember, Christ's the only one ever who has done what we're hoping to do. Imagine if, if, if you really wanted to do something, you had some goal, and there's only one person who had ever done it. Say you thought, I'm gonna, I, want, I want to win like 30 Olympic medals. There's only one person who's ever done that. His name's Michael Phelps. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to study his life, and you're going to talk to him, and you're going to find out as much as you can about him and how he trains and all these different things. But let's be real. Just because you do that doesn't mean you're going to be able to do what he did. It's not going to work. A lot of people treat Jesus the same way. Jesus is the only person who ever died and rose again never to die again. He's the only person who was ever righteous. So if that's what we want, like Paul, that's what we want, to be righteous, to, to go to heaven, to live forever. Well, we better do what Jesus did, right? Doesn't work. Can't work. Because we're not Jesus. We can't be righteous. We're not the God-man. We can't raise ourselves up from the dead. What Paul is saying, though, is that following Jesus doesn't mean doing what he did, but believing in what he did. That through baptism, you are joined with him, you are buried with him, and raised with him. That everything that is true of Jesus becomes yours through faith. His righteousness is yours, his life is yours, his death is yours, and that means that the crown of eternal life is yours too. This process can be painful, but through our sufferings, God teaches us more and more to trust only in this. He reminds us that we're weak, that we're not good enough, that we can't do it, that we're failures, and then teaches us to trust only in Christ. For this is the only way to reach the goal. As Luther again writes in his disputation, the law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. Think, what treasures are yours through faith alone? Without any doing on your own part, a wonderful, miraculous miracle that faith is given to us by God, which turns the world on its head, which changes sinners like you and me into righteous saints, which changes hell into heaven and death into life, which places us into Christ's own bosom, so that when we breathe our last breath, we breathe it into him, and he will raise us up again. We have but one goal, and it is the best goal of all. A goal for which anyone who is not a fool would willingly give up everything. It is, and it is the means of justification which bring us to that end of resurrection and life eternal. An end which in turn justifies all of the suffering that we face now. So like Paul and Luther Place your trust only in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Believe much in him, for then everything is already done. And this means certainly justifies the ends. Amen. Please arise. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
be seated. We'll sing him 568. 